this week's tutorial we're going to focus on IAS 36 impairment of assets and the first question we're going to look at which hopefully you've made an attempt at already is August 2019 a past exam question looking at flounder limited so we're going to take each of the requirements in turn and again I'm assuming you've read through the question uh, and we'll work through it, work our way through a suggested solution so first requirement is a, a nice little narrative one remember this was a closed book exam that year uh, provide the name of the accounting standard that deals primarily with impairment uh, provide the definition of impairment and then in a brief explanation of all those specific terms in the definition so let's go along here we'll do question one and we'll do part a now remember you wouldn't get a question like this in an open book exam because it's coming straight in the notes but this was a closed book exam so ias 36 is a standard that deals with impairment and we know that from our studies we covered that last week what's the definition of impairment well impairment occurs remember the key terms here when the assets or if you want to put or cash generating units cgus recoverable amount is lower than its carrying value now its carrying value is otherwise known as its net book value that's when an impairment occurs when the assets recoverable amount is lower than its carrying value if it's higher there's no adjustment so when the assets recoverable amount is lower so again we have to give the definitions remember what they're looking for here that the carrying value equals net book value which equals cost less accumulated depreciation so again it's nice and straightforward we're just getting used to that terminology so you don't get uh, confused in the day of the exam what's the recoverable amount recoverable amount is the higher of value in use which we call viu and fair value less cost to sell which we call fair value less cost to sell so again you're showing the definition of what each of them are so it's the greater how can you recover money from this asset where you can either use it value in use or sell it fair value less cost to sell so viu is the discounted future cash flows from this asset if kept that's what you can say so the discounted or the present value of future cash flows from this asset if it's kept and the fair value less cost to sell that's self-explanatory the net proceeds if the asset was sold today in an arm's length transaction what we mean by arm's length is it's a transaction between two strangers this is not a transaction that has kind of a biased price or a favorable price either way so that's an arm's length transaction so again that's your answer to part a there's a bit in there because of given the requirements just looking at your your basic knowledge of is 36 the definition of impairment and then what each of the terminologies are part b in the requirement is calculate the impairment charge first requirement and provide the journal entries so we're dealing here in part b we're not dealing with a single asset we're actually dealing with this thing called a cgu or a cash generating unit and that is a collection of assets together and IAS 36 has particular rules about how you allocate the impairment loss if there is one when you do your calculation but the overall approach is still the same at the outset you take your carrying amount which is an epoch value 900,000 your fair value less cost to sell that's also given directly in the question fair value less cost to sell be careful the fair value is 600,000 cost to sell 50 so that is 550 which is your 600 minus your 50 right doesn't take too long so far uh, that should hopefully be straightforward enough for most people the question is then what is our value in use our value in use is not given to us calculated it's given to us with the core inputs and we have to calculate what value in use is and how we do that is we get the present value of future cash flows 
So what we're told here is the cash flow in year one, two, three, and four is going to be 140,000 each year. 140, 140. So you're told that for the first four years, given in the question. The net cash flow in year five, when you assume you sell the asset, if that's your plan to hold it for five years, 500,000. Now it's not correct to add them all up and say, oh, the value in use must be 1 million and 60, right? That's not the correct answer because these are not present value. You can't add up cash flows. We call that cash flows uh, in different time periods. It doesn't make sense. And I'm relying a bit here on your knowledge of corporate finance, how to get the present value of cash flows. So if any of that doesn't make sense, please do let me know. But I'm assuming you're covering that in your AF2 corporate finance module as well. So there should hopefully be a small bit of synergies between that module and this. So it can't be 1 million and 60. You can't just add them up. We need to get the present value, PV. I, what's its value today, taking account of the time value of money. And the discount rate is 8%. So we're going to use this thing called DF, the discount factors. So you can actually use the table to calculate the present value. There's two ways of getting present value. Both will be accepted. Using the formula, and I'll show you that in a second, or using the discount factor tables. Because if you have 8%, you know the discount rate, you know each year, you can actually go to the tables and you can find what the relevant discount factor is for each year. All right, so I'm just going to pull up tables from the uh, from online. You, can, you might have printed out, you might have them in one of your finance textbooks. We'll have a copy for the exam in case you need them. So we're pulling up, I just pulled up the SEMA tables, just Google present value tables. And this gives you a shorthand to how to get the present value of cash flows when you know the number of years, number of periods, and you know the relevant discount rate. So ours here is 8% for one year, two years, three years, four years, and five years. So you slot it in, you go back, 0 0.926 for one year, 0 0.857 for two years, 0 0.857, 0 0.794, 0 0.735, and 0 0.681 for five years. So you're multiplying the cash flow by the discount factor. And you'll see same cash flow is going to be lower the further out it is because the time value of money is greater. So that's a core logic of corporate finance, which you should be covering in AF2 as well. If anyone has difficulty with that, please let me know. That's one way to do it is your present value tables. We say the present value of 140,000 in one year's time at 8% is 129,640 today. And you do that down along. You multiply the 140 by 0.857. So notice here, it's the same amount of money. You wait 12 months to get this one. You wait 24 months to get the other one. The longer you wait, the less it's worth in today's money. And today's money we know is the present value. Same again in year three, it's worth even lower. And in year four, it's worth even lower. And finally, then year five, the discount factor is 0 0.681. And that present value today is 340. So the value in use, which is the present value of all those future cash flows, is about 804,000. Now, depending on whether you do one, two decimals or three decimals, you might get a different rounding. But 804, 180 is the correct answer there. And I'll highlight those so you know where they're coming from. So I'll just put there present value using discount factor tables. So that's how you get it using the discount factor tables, just so we know exactly where it comes from. Now, there is another approach just to show you. Gets a slightly different answer, but you'd still get full marks. Get the present value using present value formula. I'll just show you what the formula is, because again, it should be familiar to you. The present value, PV, equals the future value divided by 1 plus R to the power of N. 
So that's your key present value formula. You get the future cash flow, which are these, paid in each year, divided by 1 plus R, which is 1 plus the relevant discount rate. In our question here, it is 8%, and the number of years. So it's to the power of 1 for one year, to the power of 2, etc. So if we just do this in Excel, again, just for time purposes, it would be the 140, which is the future value. That means how much it's going to be paid in the future, at the end of one year, at the end of two years, etc. Divided by 1.08, which is 1 plus the discount rate, to the power of 1, because this is the first year cash flow. So this gets us 129,630. Whereas if we use the present value tables, it gets us 129,640. That rounding difference is fine. If you use either of those, you'll get full marks in the exam. Don't worry too much. Rounding difference is fine. In year two, maybe pause this now and see can you do it in your calculator. Equals 140 divided by 1 plus R, 1.08, to the power of two years, because it's two years away, which is 120 and 27. Whereas if we use the tables, it got us 119,980. Again, about 100 or 200 out. Not even 200 out, but 40 out, should I say. So not a huge difference. And it's acceptable in the exam. 140 divided by 1.08 to the power of 3. 140 divided by 1.08 to the power of 4. And finally then, 500 divided by 1.08 to the power of 5. So when you tot them up, it's about 804,000 again. So either of those would have been acceptable. Both will get full marks, and there's not a huge difference. So don't be too concerned which one you use. Just make sure you're happy how you get the present value and how it relates to the value in use. And if anyone has any questions on that, please do get in contact. But hopefully it makes sense. Rounding differences are fine. So if we take that information then and we bring it back up to the question, the value in use is now 804. So that means our recoverable amount is the higher of these, which is 804. So if we bring it down here, our carrying value is 900. Our recoverable amount is the 804,180. So that means we have an impairment because the recoverable amount is lower than the carrying value. It's an impairment of just over 95,000. And that is something you have to make sure that you understand. This is the higher of value in use and fair value less cost to sell. That's how you get the recovery amount. So that's our first thing, calculate the impairment charge. The impairment charge here is 95,820. The debits and credits. Well, you're definitely going to be debiting the SOPL, impairment expense. That's always the case, the 95. Just be careful now, there are rules. There's three different assets in your cash generating unit. The first rule is always wipe out goodwill first. So you get rid of goodwill under IAS 36. IAS 36 says always goodwill is the first thing to be written off. You then credit property the rest. You do not allocate any to trade receivables. Trade receivables do not fall under the remit of IS 36. They actually fall under the remit of IFRS 9. So it's a bit of an inconsistency. We do include it to calculate the carrying amount. We don't include it when we're writing off or writing down the assets. Because our logic is these trade receivables are at their current amount. They don't have any write down. So the write down must be relating to goodwill. Or in this case, the difference is property. So you do not write down trade receivables. They don't fall under the remit of IAS 36 because they are a financial asset. They fall under the remit of IFRS 9. So we're assuming they're not impaired. We leave them at the 150. That means the rest of the impairment must be allocated against the property. Goodwill is allocated first. You then pro rata all the other assets in the CGU. We've only one asset left that's relevant, so therefore it all goes to the property. So hopefully that makes sense. That's an exam level question. You have to calculate the value in use. You have to determine what the impairment charge was, 
and then you have to use the IS36 rules to allocate the impairment loss accordingly. So the next requirement here, part C, again, a more discursive uh, requirement, seeing your understanding, your interpretation of some of the requirements in IS36. Discuss the following statement. It would be more appropriate to just have recoverable amount equal to fair value less cost to disposal. Uh, and value and use calculation should be prohibited. So would you agree or disagree with this and what's your logic? Now, realistically, there's probably only one answer here that should, should be accurate, uh, which is that you should disagree with this. The logic is here, well, the whole idea of having the higher of both is, there's no guarantee that you're going to sell this asset. So most likely you're going to disagree. Right? Not every company will want to or be in a position to sell the relevant asset, the relevant asset or CGU, right? It could be more valuable in use compared to being sold off. So not a fair comparison for impairment calculations so i'm only giving you a high level look at what you're looking at what we're trying to say here is it wouldn't be fair just to say use the fair value less cost to sell and you can use part b example above as an illustration so you can use that example above so if we go back up and we look here we said the value in use is 804 the fair value less cost to sell is 550. what this statement is saying is you should just use this 550 as the recovered amount. In that case, you would have a huge impairment, 350,000, even though it's worth 800,000 to keep it and use it in the business. So it's not really a fair statement there. It wouldn't really get at what the purpose of impairment is. It would defeat the purpose of IS36. IS36 is only interested if how much you can recover from the asset is lower than its cost. Whereas here, we can recover value from the asset by holding it internally. So that is a valid answer. Right? So that's just giving you an idea. We're looking for students own take on it. It'd be very hard to agree that. Now, you might argue and say agree because one big issue, of course, with value and use is it's subjective in terms of forecasting cash flows. And that might create a problem. But of course, fair value less cost to sell is subjective as well, unless you have a readily available market. And even then, it's going to be an estimate. So a value in use is necessary here to figure out the net value of using the asset. It wouldn't be a fair comparison otherwise um, because the value of an asset doesn't necessarily lie in what you can sell it for. The value of a lot of assets lie in what you can use it for and the cash flows it can generate. So just giving you kind of those kind of analytical type questions where there's no right answer in terms of technical right, but it's about how you justify your points. Uh, and I think most of the points that have valid uh, or validity would be the ones who would disagree with that. And they would say the way it's currently set up is the fairest way. You can either recover value from selling it, therefore fair value less cost to sell is relevant, or you can recover value from using it, therefore value in use is relevant. And we take the higher one because that's what we assume a company would do uh, from an economic perspective. All right. And another one, part D then, uh, is asking you, using a simple example, illustrative example, to sim demonstrate how IAS 36 potentially allows directors to engage in earnings management. Right, so now this was a bigger focus in previous years. Um, but earnings management is essentially where um, the directors and the management of the company try to smooth out earnings. So you won't have big years of profit and then followed by big years of losses. Because oftentimes managers only get paid bonuses when they make a profit. So if they can smooth out those peaks and troughs and have a more predictable profit each year, shareholders like it and also the management will like it because it kind of gives them a predictable bonus as well. So how can IAS 36 potentially allow directors to engage in earnings management? We'll take a little example here where you have a profit in year one of, uh, we'll say 60 million, right? Management team bonus um, is based on reaching a target profit 
of 30 million. Just a basic like that. So in year one, they get the bonus. There's no issue. They get a bonus. It's quite profitable. Right? However, what happens in year two? Year two, we'll say, for example, COVID happens. And therefore, what happens is they make small profit of, say, we'll say 10 million. So profit declines because of COVID or whatever reason, uh, profit has declined. Now, no bonus in year two. Do not hit target. Well, what we're trying to show you here is one of the reasons directors and management engage in earnings management is to smooth out this. Now, part of it comes to maybe poorly, poorly constructed bonus schemes that allow this to happen. But part of it is also down to mis bad interpretation of the accounting standards. That's where auditors come in to call these out as well. Directors may use IAS 36 to create, and I'll put it in inverted commas, create an impairment in year one and then reverse the impairment in year two. For example, impairment in year one of 20 million, which means that equals profit equals 60 minus 20 equals 40. Bonus target is still met. So if you did, for example, you calculated an impairment in year one of 20 million, well, your 60 million profit minus the 20, which would hit the expenses, is 40. Decide to reverse it in year two. And that means the profit of 10 million We'll have a reversal of an impairment. Now we'll assume depreciation is a material. So you add on the 20 million, gets you 30 million, and bonus target is not met. Simplistic example here ignores impact of depreciation. So we know there's a limit in terms of your reversal of, a, of an impairment, but it just gives you an idea that's how it might be used. Now, COVID may not be the best example. It might be hard to say there's a reversal of an impairment in year two. But what we're trying to show you is there's a lot of subjectivity in impairment calculations. You have to estimate the fair value less cost to sell. You have to estimate all the net cash flows or project them out. And you have to assume an appropriate discount rate. So in different circumstances, the company or the directors, or the management team may use those subjectivities to move impairment losses and impairment reversals each year. And that's something that the auditors have to look out for to see is there any engagement of earnings management where they're trying to smooth out the profits and have significant profits each year so they'll qualify for the bonus each year. So there can be incentives. And that gets back to positive accounting theory that we talked about last year, last semester, where you're looking at the bonus hypothesis. Management will engage and choose accounting policies or accounting decisions, which maximizes their bonus. So it's something to be aware of. Now, there are strict rules around how many years cash flows, what discount rate to use, but there is always an element of subjectivity. And one big thing that companies have to do is make a huge amount of disclosures. And I showed you that in IS 36 lectures when we looked at Glombi and Kerry Group and CRH, you have to disclose everything about your projections, your discount rate you used, how many or much impairment that you had. So, so users of financial statements can see that transparency. But that's just a simple illustrative example how when there is peaks and troughs or lumpy profit profiles in terms of up one year, down the other year, that doesn't really suit management who want predictable profits to look good and also who want to qualify for their bonus. So they can use impairment. When I say create like that in inverted commas, they might change their assumptions, change their cash flow assumptions, change their fair value that's cost to sell to get where they need to be. Now, of course, there's a role of the auditor to check the validity of those assumptions. Uh, and that's what they have to watch out for as well. So earnings management is a tricky concept to watch for. Uh, and that's the role of the auditor to make sure that there isn't um, flagrant breaking of those rules and breaching of the accounting standards. All right, so we're now going to move on to question two, which is another impairment question, just slightly different setup. 
gives another aspect of IAS 36, question two. And we look at part A first. So this is a co company called Morkin PLC. They have one cash generating unit called Jur Juram. And what you're asked here is calculate the impairment loss as a result of the impairment review for Jerome uh, at the end of December 2017. Then calculate the ca carrying values after the allocation of the impairment loss and give them the journal entries. So again, it's the impairment of a cash generating unit. Again, it's IAS 36. We have the carrying value given directly in the question, 7.8 million. I'll put just the three zeros there. We have fair value, less cost to sell. We're told here, the company made a loss and an impairment view on that date indicated a recoverable amount was 6 million. So you put 6 million there. So the, the recoverable amount was 6 million. So they actually make it easier for you. Just be careful of that. Recoverable amount of 6 million. So this question actually simplified it. You didn't have to calculate fair value, less cost to sell. You didn't have to calculate value in use. They said the recoverable amount, watch their language and watch the terms used, was 6 million. So that means we have an impairment. The impairment is 1.8 million. Why? Because your recoverable amount is 1.8 million lower than what it's carried in the book or carried in the financial statements. So that's your part A. Your impairment loss is 1.8 million. Nice and straightforward one. Shorter one. This, this could be a, a note to an IS1 question, making it a bit easier rather than having a full question IS36. Then part B and part C are very much intertwined. Part B is asking you, what are the carrying values of the assets after the allocation of the impairment loss? And then what are the journal entries as part C? So you're told here the recoverable amount of the property plant and equipment is 4.5 million. And the net realizable value of net current assets is the same as their fair value. So the allocation is going to be goodwill goes first, always 800. So that means of the 1.8 million impairment loss, 800 is written off against goodwill. That's the rule in IS 36. That then leaves PP, development expenditure, and net current assets. So the rule then is after you allocate goodwill, or the impairment loss to goodwill, you pro rata each of the rest of them. But there is a rule here, net current assets, they can't be reduced below their fair value. So they're gonna get nil. Cannot be reduced below fair value, outside scope of IAS 36. So remember those net current assets, your cash, your inventory, your trade receivables, they are calculated, used to calculate the carrying value, but they're outside the scope then. You don't write them down using IS 36, it's IS 2 for inventory, IFS 9 for trade receivables. And the fact that the million carrying value equates to their fair value means they shouldn't be written down any further. So then what we're left with is, we are left with property plant and equipment, and we're left with development expenditure. And generally what we do here is we do it pro rata. So for example, we would say 1 million, which is the remaining impairment loss, times 5.2 million over 6 million. Now where's that coming from? The 5.2 million is the amount of the carrying value of property, plant and equipment, and the 6 million is property, plant and equipment and development expenditure added together. So what percentage pro rata is that of both so you would allocate 866 development expenditure it'd be a million times 800 over 6 million which would be 133 so that would be your initial allocation now i'm saying initial because we may come across a problem here so eight we'll just we'll round it to single it's fine so that would be the initial allocation i'll say there initial so that means the carrying amounts, CA, or the, we call it, what do they call it? CV, carrying value. I'll just take that and put it over. Carrying value here would be nil. Carrying value here, 52 minus 867. Carrying value here, 800 minus 133. And carrying value here is a million still. 
So the carrying value is now 6 million, which matches your recovered amount above. Now there is a problem, and this is where the exam level question comes in. It's this piece of information here. There is a rule, an extra rule in IAS 36 that says you cannot impair an individual asset below its individual recoverable amount. So when you're allocating to IAS 36 cash generating units, you have to check, am I impairing an asset below its individual carrying amount or individual recoverable amount, should I say? And that is the case here. This is below the 4.5 million. So need to adjust allocation. So if we bring this down again, the updated allocation, the 800 still stays with goodwill. You're now only allocating 700. And then the rest, which is 300, goes to development expenditure. Can only impair PP down to 4.5 million. That's where that rule is coming from. So I'm going to highlight that and highlight these as the key differences. Just bear with me here. Highlight this and highlight this. That's the key thing of this particular tutorial question. When you're allocating, watch for if you're told individual um, recoverable amounts. If you are, then you have to, there's a max impairment. You can only bring the property planted equipment down to 4.5 million because that's what you can recover for it individually. You can't go below that. So that means what does our debits and credits look like? On our debits and credits here, we are going to debit the SOPL, impairment loss, 1.8 million. That's fairly straightforward. Given in the question, you calculated that. You're going to credit goodwill. That has to be fully written off. That's the rule in IS 36, 800,000. Fully taken away. You're going to credit PP, 700,000. That's the maximum you can credit. Even though it says it should have got 867, you can only bring it from 52 down to 4.5. Then you're going to credit development expenditure, the rest, 500,000. Sorry, 300,000 to bring it down to 500,000. So there's your 1.8 million, and that's the debit as well. That was a tricky one. A lot of students would have just given me that allocation, 867 and 133. But there's a little quirk in IAS 36, and you have to watch for that when you are reading the question. If there's a cash generating unit, which is a common one in exam questions, and if you're told about the individual recoverable amount of assets, the examiner is hinting at something to watch for limits in terms of your impairment. Right. So that is the end then of tutorial for this week, focused on IAS 36. And I looked at two past exam questions, one full question on flounder with some little narratives and one shorter note from a qu bigger question uh, dealing with the impairment of a CGU and the limits on that impairment as well.